Nebraska farmers are constantly innovating with sustainable agriculture systems, working to improve their bottom line while protecting the local environment. Learn about soil health, water quality, and much more from both farmers and sustainable agriculture experts. That's tonight on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks for joining us on Speaking of Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Tonight we'll hear from lawmakers on a contentious bill that would impact funding for public schools. But first we dig into sustainable agriculture and its recent growth in Nebraska. As Becca Costello of NET News reports, the benefits of sustainable practices are significant, but it can be difficult to make the transition. A sustainable agriculture system is healthy and stable enough to keep operating for a long time. For the Nebraska Sustainable Agriculture Society, the mission is broad enough to include a lot of different goals. To promote agriculture and food systems that build healthy land, people, communities, and quality of life for present and future generations. Earlier this year, the group met in Grand Island for the Healthy Farms Conference. Producers from all over the state swapped ideas and learned about the latest updates. A lot of folks are starting to focus on the word regenerate and regenerative agriculture and that is kind of coming from corporate level and market level pressures. They're not only thinking of the consumer that wants, you know, good, healthy, clean food, uh, but they're also thinking of like, we need to start doing something about climate change. We need to start doing something about how we're treating the earth. Organic farming is an increasingly popular way to meet those sustainability goals. The U.S. Department of Agriculture certified 165 organic operations here in 2014. Five years later, the number doubled to 324. And interest doesn't seem to be slowing down. About 100 Nebraskans attended a recent workshop on how to transition to organic farming, hosted by the University of Nebraska Extension. They learned about the risks and benefits of an organic operation and how to become USDA certified. It requires practices like crop rotation, cover crops, and avoiding synthetic pesticides. But a lot of farmers are using sustainable methods without organic certification, and the environment they're concerned about is often their own community. Anybody who lives on an acreage or even in town, you know, if you're using fertilizer, chemicals, it's on sometimes a smaller scale, but if everybody's doing it, it has the potential to um, cause some effects for, you know, surface water initially, but then again, some of it is being pulled into the groundwater. Jamie Taney farms a few acres of corn and soybeans with her husband and three boys in Valparaiso. She's also a resource conservationist for the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. And she knows transitioning away from traditional methods isn't easy. But it's really difficult when they are talking about the bottom line and making big changes. I mean, you can say we're going to get rid of a certain herbicide, but then it changes their whole plan um, for that year. Taney says part of her job is encouraging farmers to adopt methods that don't damage local resources. But she knows producers are juggling other concerns as well. But at the end of the day, with prices the way they are, we really need to figure out how can we be forward thinkers and make good decisions on that will make us keep us sustainable for future, for those years to come. For Speaking of Nebraska, I'm Becca Costello. Joining us now are Chuck Francis, a professor of agronomy and horticulture at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and Dave Welsh, a certified organic farmer since 1993. Welcome to you both. I'll start off with what probably seems like a simple question, but it may be the hardest question of all. In just a couple of sentences, define for me what you consider to be sustainable agriculture. Chuck? Sustainable agriculture is something that can be maintained for a long time without putting a real time frame on it. It means looking over the horizon that uh, Resource availability, it means thinking long-term rather than short-term and short-term profits. Dave? Yeah, I'd agree with a lot of that. It's the, the mentioned profitability there. It has to be sustainably that way. It can't be a, a net loss like a lot of conventional farming is right now. And, and environmentally, you need to not only sustain, but hopefully improve the soils that you're working with and the environment around you. And, and also, a uh, Socially, are you going to be able to support the community and the people around you with the type of agriculture that we have? 
Now, your story, you got into organic farming back in 1993. You were probably one of the first farmers in Nebraska to do this. Why did you make that decision to become an organic farmer? Okay, we, well, my wife and I, we were married in 1980, and going through the 80s was a very challenging time to start into the farming profession, and, and the profits weren't there, very high interest rates, and uh, so kind of, there's probably three main points. We were, our, our faith, I guess, directed us to organic farming. We just felt that that was the way God wanted us to care for the land, the soil, the livestock that we were in charge of. Uh, our family was important. We were beginning our family, or had two young children. Uh, we wanted to protect them from the chemical inputs that were in a lot of conventional agriculture. And, uh, and then just farming, you know, the, the organic uh, way of farming, it was more sustainable as we just talked about. We felt we could uh, not only preserve the land, the soil, the water, the air, but uh, hopefully improve it through organic farming methods. So it wasn't about profit? Not initially, there really wasn't much of a uh, premium for organic crops. When we were first certified in 93, you know, you might have had a, a dime or a quarter on a bushel of corn or soybeans, but uh, not like today where it's, it's more of a multiplier effect rather than addition. So, yeah. I got to ask you too, what was the reaction from your fellow farmers when they found out you were doing this? Oh, you know, back in the late 80s when we started to transition and were certified in 93, it was probably the first comment was organic farming, that's just going to be a fad. You know, it's going to be around for a little while and then it's going to go away. And uh, that's usually from the guys that were farming. Usually their wives were more interested because they, you know, they were handling the laundry of their husbands that were using, you know, chemical products to control weeds and insects and whatnot. And, and the health of their children and the food that they were eating. They, the wives typically were more interested than what the husbands were, but uh, you know, they, they put up with us. They, nobody, nobody shunned us as friends, they, <laughs> they kept us around. So. Chuck, in your research, do you find Dave's story to be a, a, a one that's very common for farmers as to why they make that switch? Yeah, I think this really echoes a lot of the attitudes uh, which have changed quite a bit over the last 30 years and relative to the washing of clothes and pesticides, something that made a big impact was an extension bulletin that came out probably 20, 25 years ago that suggested that all clothes that you've worn in the field while spraying should be washed three times um, before you put them back on again. And uh, a lot of women took that very seriously and said to their spouses, hey, wh what yeah. are you doing out there in the field? And I go back to my own experience in California growing up spraying in peaches where we didn't have protective clothing, face masks or anything, and mixing these things with a lot of fumes coming up and uh, kind of surprising I survived, I guess. But that, that's a part of the story. And I think to add along with that, with the, he mentioned the laundry and there was an extension circular back then, but it wasn't so much how you clean the clothing of the person applying the chemicals, but then how do you clean up the washing machine before you launder your, your children and the rest of the family's clothes and the contamination that can happen there. So it, it was a big issue back then. So in your opinions, if we stick to the status quo right now and don't change agricultural me methods, uh, what's, what's that gonna mean for our future, Chuck? Well, I think we have to look at it in the long term. Again, the uh, current system is producing a lot of stuff. A lot of it's raw material that we ship out of the state. In fact, we only consume about 10% of our total diet from things that are produced in Nebraska, which always amazes me. Um, but it shows that there's a huge potential to increase local foods, to increase food crops as compared to industrial crops that are turned into ethanol and plastics. Uh, even the uh, animal feeding, we have to question in the long term, uh, putting things through ruminant animals that are evolved to graze and eat crop roughages and graze places like the sand hills and graze our residues, uh, they didn't evolve to eat grain. So that's somewhere we can make up this difference, this deficit, and we have to look at the big picture, as Dave said, of uh, what, what are these crops doing? Uh, and with the plastics and with ethanol, uh, maybe these are good ways to increase the price a few cents per bushel in the short term. But in the long term, we're going to need food. And as the Secretary of Agriculture mentioned in a uh, release just today, I guess, or yesterday, uh, we need to increase food by 30 to 40 percent. We need to cut food waste. We need to dedicate more interest to food than we do to the industrial side of things. 
Now, the Secretary of Agriculture coming out this week with an agricultural innovation agenda saying the goal is to increase production by 40 percent while cutting the environmental footprint of U.S. agriculture in half by 2050. Is that realistic? Well, it depends. It depends on resource availability. It depends on whether we really have the potential to produce that much more. Uh, we're going to have to globally somehow. But our researchers in the and the Department of Agronomy are looking at yield plateaus in our major cereals. We're talking about rice, corn, and wheat that provide about 60% of the calories worldwide. And we're up on sort of yield plateaus for all of those. And transgenic hybrids, new genetic materials, that can help us to uh, make management easier. They can help in certain stress situations, but they've not really increased yield potential genetically. So when you're up against this kind of plateau, um, do you keep pushing that, or do you look for other ways, such as improving management, um, finding ways to rotate crops with animals grazing, um, looking at other crops? When we have uh, so much of our attention on three major crops, and Dave and I were talking before the show that uh, we get most of our human nutrition from something like 18 or 20 crops worldwide, and they've, people have consumed several thousand crops over the long history, and most of those really have not been studied very well in research. So we have much more potential to increase yield on things other than our major crops at this point in time. And I, I think one of the, for the USDA to reach those goals, I think it depends on where they want to put their research dollars. You know, if we continue to put research dollars into uh, typical conventional ag where it's, okay, we've identified this pest, now we need to develop a chemical to overcome it. Or will they put their research dollars into more sustainable and organic practices? Uh, one area where there's huge crossover right now between conventional and, and organic agriculture is in the uh, cover crop approach. I mean, that's been highly accepted in both conventional and organic systems. And if we could have some more focus on what cover crops can do, especially multi-species cover crops, you know, the salad bowl type mix things, uh, I think we could make some great gains, but without the research dollars going towards those types of solutions, it'll be difficult to reach the goals that they have there. Talking with Dave Welsh, certified organic farmer in Nebraska, and also uh, Chuck Francis, professor of agronomy at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, Dave, what do you see as the biggest benefits of going organic? Well, you know, we, we kind of outlined what we looked at back, you know, quite a few years ago in the early 90s. Today, uh, there are some major price premiums out there. Uh, but I always tell farmers that are looking at going uh, or considering going towards organic production, don't consider the, just the profitability. You know, it, there is great profit in organic farming right now, and it can sustain your family and your community. But it's, you really have to have a heart for the environment and protecting the soil out there, the water, the air. Um, if you don't have that desire to protect those things and, and not to, to protect them at the base level we're at now, but try to improve them. Uh, our soils in Nebraska uh, used to be at 8% organic matter. Now you have trouble finding soils that are above 2% organic matter. But at, using cover crops and conventional and using no-till, they've started to increase organic matter there. and. Uh, in our system and on our farms, we're up in the three to four percent range now of organic matter because of the tools that we've used. So um, those are some of the things to consider. So you touched on profitability, and I want to talk about that just a little bit. Uh, the ag markets have been tough for in recent years, so right. there's probably farmers out there saying, I can't afford to go organic. But you're saying the profit is there if they do go organic? Oh, definitely. It, uh, you know, as a rule of thumb, you could almost take corn prices or soybean prices, whatever conventional is, you could probably take them times two, maybe even two and a half to arrive at an organic price. And so obviously there's potential there. If you can maintain your yields or, or even if you're not able to grow as great of yield as what you had as a conventional farmer because of the price premiums there, uh, you're still going to come out dollars ahead. And really what you're trading is the you know, you're gonna put more labor into organic farming, no doubt about it. Typically there's cultivating that takes place, maybe a little bit more soil preparation prior to planting versus a conventional no-till system. But uh, in our operation, we enjoyed the added labor 
and as such, instead of paying for a chemical herbicide to control weeds in our field, we were hiring local junior high, high school kids. We had a local community college in our town. Uh, it was great to put money into the youth of our community rather than sending it down the road to some large corporation. Chuck, what about regulations? Uh, is it still the Wild West out there, or are there the proper amount of regulations on organic farming? Well, it depends on who you talk to. If you talk to farmers, there are too many, and if you talk to environmentalists, there aren't enough. But in general, I think we're very cautious now with most of our products. Uh, one of the problems is they don't always stay exactly where you uh, apply them. And we've had a major problem with one of the herbicides that's knocked down soybeans in neighboring farms and with uh, fumes that go up into the air after it's been applied and uh, can go five miles or more downwind. But I want to comment on the economics that you asked sure. about. We just finished this week some analysis of uh, 18 years of a nine-year rotation in Hamilton County on an organic farm. And we compared that with the Hamilton County um, average yields and average costs on both continuous corn and on corn soybean rotation. And in Nebraska, we have about half the corn is continuous and about half is in a corn bean two-year rotation. The uh, organic farm, even with lower yields, was profitable in all except one of those 18 years. The corn soybean rotation was uh, only profitable in about four of those years, or no, five, I guess, in the continuous corn in four of those years during the good years around 1910, 11, 12. So the profits are there, as Dave says. Um, there's still an onus about organic because people see it as going backwards rather than forwards. Um, they see a weedy field and they say, well, that must be organic. And yet agriculture changes. When I was in high school out in California, there was a big debate between my peers, my age, and their dads. Their dads were tilling, dads and moms, were tilling their orchards and vineyards after every single irrigation, which meant five or six, seven tillage processes through the whole season. And the young guys, my age, were talking about putting in cover crops, leaving a mix there, using that to harbor beneficial insects and maintain cover on the land and prevent erosion and all the rest. So these things do change with generations. And I think when people see the profits that Dave was talking about, and they realize that organic is not a niche market now, the major amount of organic food is sold through major supermarket chains. And um, it's, it's a big industry. It's $60 billion now in the US. So it's not a niche anymore. And that's why the, the large operators are getting into this. So, Dave, if the profitability is there, are we seeing more farmers in Nebraska go towards organic farming? And if not, why not? You know, as, as the chart in the opening showed, you know, we've doubled the number of organic farms in Nebraska in the last five years, and it's great to see that happening. Um, and I think, in part, that's happening due to the price premiums that are out there. You know, everybody wants to make money. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to work all year long and end up breaking even at the end of the year or even losing money. Uh, for a conventional farmer today to transition to organics, I think the big challenge is that no-till has been so widespread in the last couple of decades that farmer, there's a lot of younger farmers today, they've never been on a cultivator. And that's certainly one of the key tools to use in weed control in an organic operation. Um, you know, going beyond that, again, it goes back to research. You know, maybe there's some potential out there to do some no-till organic farming, uh, where you might plant a small grain, you roll it down, create a mat of mulch to cover the soil, you, you no-till the soybeans, let's say, into that. Um, but we need some research on that to see if that can truly be sustainable and uh, consistent from year to year, depending on, obviously, in Nebraska, our weather changes dramatically from one season to the next. So uh, having the proper research done to help us find the best tools to maybe do a no-till organic, that'd be great research for us to conduct. I think that the whole answer is not necessarily just organic farming either. Uh, I find in my agro agronomy classes, where I have quite a few uh, young people from farms here in Nebraska, they're really listening now in ways um, that they didn't 10 years ago to some of the organic practices. And I, we'll jump to Sweden for a minute. They set a goal way back uh, about 10 years ago that they would be 20% organic production by the year 2020. Well, they reached that 
about five years earlier, but it was not all certified. About half of it was certified organic, and the rest uh, was made up of livestock crop production by people using organic practices, but not certifying because of the paperwork and extra bother of that. But they knew their customers that are selling their things locally. There was a degree of trust in the system. And I think that's what I'm seeing now in the classroom is people listening to these organic practice ideas and saying, well, you yeah, know, that might work on my farm. And wow, resistant weeds are a huge problem. Uh, we know we can't just spray and spray again. Uh, we've got to think a little more creatively outside the box about other options. So we just have a little bit of time left. So in a sentence or two, the future of sustainable agriculture, how do you feel about it, Dave? Well, I think, you know, the sky's the limit with sustainable and organic agriculture. It's uh, becoming more accepted. And if we can do some more research to help it grow, I, th I think it's, it's the future of uh, Nebraska agriculture. Chuck? I don't think we have any choice in the really long term. We've got to figure out how to produce enough food for everybody. We've got to figure out a way to keep our crops healthy. And I think the diversity, rotations, going to new crops, going to new systems, as Dave mentioned, organic no-till or non-chemical no-till is part of the answer. It's going to take us a while to do that. And I think we'll be looking to other countries, other places where crops come in because that's the way it's always been. Okay. Chuck Francis, uh, professor of agronomy at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and Dave Wells, certified organic farmer. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. This interview and tonight's program are available on our website. Just go to netnebraska.org slash speakingofnebraska and join the conversation on social media. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at NET News Nebraska. We're getting into the heart of this year's legislative session and Fred Knapp of NET News has been keeping track of what lawmakers are up to. Fred, every week it seems we talk about property tax relief. There's a bill that came out of the Revenue Committee. Is that getting any traction? It's halfway through the first round of debate, and there's a lot of uh, back and forth, I would say, on either side. Um, this is a bill that attempts to lower property taxes by substituting state aid dollars to schools for them using state sources like sales and income taxes. State revenues are coming in higher than projected right now, but there's concern that uh, what will happen when that trend changes. Senator Wendy DeBoer expressed that concern. Senator Luann Linehan tried to reassure her colleagues. Colleagues, I'm concerned about making policy with a gun to our heads. When you have a gun to your head, if this is the only solution, this is the only train in the station, I'm worried that you might promise anything, even if you can't pay for it later. And I am willing to negotiate to work with people who have concerns about this bill, I am more than willing to do that. What I'm not willing to do is say we're just going to hand out $500 million and nothing else. That is not responsible. Now, Fred, uh, Senator Lenahan referred to $500 million and nothing else. What did she mean there? She's talking about the amount of increased state aid over the next three years. Uh, and the nothing else uh, that she doesn't want is without spending controls on local school districts to ensure that all of that additional state money re actually results in lowering property taxes. So um, the cap that she wants is inflation plus real growth in property values due to construction. Uh, the schools object to that. They say... Uh, our costs for uh, salaries and benefits are higher than inflation. The counter argument to that is, well, you've got to live within the same means that the citizens do. So they're at kind of a stalemate right now. Uh, Linehan said she's going to meet with uh, schools over the weekend. She says uh, she needs 33 votes to overcome a filibuster. She says she has 32 and a half. <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it, so a little bit in flux there. Right. Uh, there's also been a lot of discussions this session about prisons. Uh, it's another big issue that we're dealing with. What's, what's the latest with that? Well, there was a proposal for sentencing reform which would have said the minimum sentence can't be any higher than one half of the maximum sentence. The significance of that is prisoners are eligible for parole after they finish half of their minimum sentence, assuming they've behaved in prison. So it would have made a bunch of people eligible for parole earlier. 
but it was essentially talked into oblivion. Um, and then the next thing that came out was the Department of Correctional Services floated the idea of a new prison construction, which would be very expensive. Uh, they're just asking for a request for information at this point, but there was talk, oh, it could be 1,600 beds located between Lincoln and Omaha uh, and cost $200 million. The department says that's all speculative and they're really just trying to get information on what's gonna happen right now. Meanwhile, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee has his own proposal for 300 correct, uh, community corrections beds, work release center beds in Omaha, but it's unlikely the governor would go along with that. And uh, so they're kind of at a stalemate. And meanwhile, there's an ACLU lawsuit hanging over their heads on prison overcrowding that could result in a judge ordering people released. One other topic, Senator Moorfeld has been working on a surprise medical bill, Bill, uh, I guess you could say, so tell, tell me a little bit about that. Well, that advanced. Uh, it uh, tries to eliminate people going to the emergency room and then being surprised by these huge bills because they weren't in network. So it requires the insurance companies and the hospitals to work that out between themselves and tries to hold the patients harmless. This short session seems to really be moving along. What are some of the things we should be looking for in the week ahead? Well, uh, senators have identified their priority bills, uh, and there are a whole bunch of uh, controversial subjects. Uh, one would ban uh, a procedure that's used for second trimester abortions. There are scholarships for charter, private, and parochial schools. There's business tax incentives, and there's letting college athletes profit from their name, image, and likeness. So there's plenty of stuff for the lawmakers to discuss. We'll see how soon they get to it. And as we get down to the end of the session, we're probably going to be looking at some late nights. Absolutely. Uh, that's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> they are? Really? <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Fred keeps us informed on what's happening in the legislature each day. You can listen for his updates on NET Radio at 545 and 745 weekday mornings and 545 in the evening. And read his stories each day on our website at netnebraska.org slash news. You'll also find in-depth signature stories from the entire NET News team there. Recent stories included one on a University of Nebraska-Lincoln study that shows 40% of people have increased stress and anxiety over politics. We also reported on how many farmers started growing hemp for the first time last year, but some have been losing crops to thieves. And we continue to cover Nebraska's role in combating the spread of the coronavirus disease, COVID-19. The first group of Americans under quarantine at Camp Ashland have been released to go home, and a smaller group is quarantined at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We'll keep you up to date online at netnebraska.org slash news. That's all for this week on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks to Chuck Francis and Dave Welsh for joining us and to Fred Knapp for his reporting and to all those behind the scenes who work to bring this show to you. Tune in next week to learn more about the 2020 census and efforts to make sure every Nebraskan is counted. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for watching.